welcome you to the lecture and to introduce Tila Schultz, who, um, it, it, it really makes my heart glad to be here to, uh, doing this because he's been a friend for a number of years. And we we met in um, in Leipzig years ago, before he moved to Berlin. And I had the great pleasure of um, having Tila take me around Leipzig and introduced me to some of the, the monuments, some of the places there that were really important to the um, historical shifts that resulted in the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I, one of the reasons I'm, I'm mentioning this is that I think there's a real attentiveness to the way that history imbues uh, places and experiences um, and material stuff with uh, different kinds of energies that, that can be tapped into by artists and other kinds of, of thinkers in, in um, interesting ways. And Tila does that with a lot of nuance and complexity in many aspects of his work. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to share with you is a, a, a phrase that he is often used to talk about, um, talk about his art, uh, the, the phrase is social formalism. And he describes that as a working strategy or tool. I'm going to give you a quote. Uh, from the old email, uh, to deal with the very complex matter of formalism and politics in a very simple way. The complex situation includes, for instance, formalism versus realism, formalism and Cold War politics, and my new self-confidence that I can transport political and social issues through certain media and forms and don't necessarily have to illustrate them. Um, so, so I, 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 I wanted to throw out that phrase social formalism because it's really critical to his thinking and to his making, but it's not something that he's going to be addressing so explicitly in today's talk, which will deal more with audience and the multifaceted ways that he has engaged um, you, the viewer, the participant, in projects that include um, a whole range of installations, writing projects, curatorial work. Um, it's a really rich and complex practice that uh, has been presented in all kinds of situations in galleries and um, museums in Europe and in the United States. And he'll tell you a little bit more about that. Anything else? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, first of all, to Stephanie and Zach inviting me here to the University of Chicago and Zach has been an amazing host. He picked me up from the airport yesterday, uh, drove me around uh, today to all the, the studio visits, and it has been quite welcoming. Thank you, Zach and Stephanie. Um, also, thank you for you. Uh, it's Friday afternoon, so I know weekend is calling. Um, so I really appreciate the high number of students and staff members, I guess, um, <coughs> attending this, this lecture. In general, my work has been connected to different questions of display. Uh, I've done extensive research about exhibiting, exhibiting what exhibiting can mean in a society, but also in a closed circle of uh, art exhibitions. Um, one of my main focus has been the relationship between presentation and representation. In general, I always try to develop a visual vocabulary for these kind of fields. Uh, very often, these, this vocabulary is shifting then, so you might see today two very different looking exhibitions. What I would like to do today is to focus on the role of audience or how I um, think about audience, think about myself as part of the audience and um, how I engage audience with exhibitions. And I would like to take you on a tour uh, through two exhibitions. One was an exhibition at the uh, Secession in Vienna in Austria, uh, a solo exhibition I was invited to in 2008, and a second exhibition which is a small gallery show, or was a small gallery, sh gallery show in 2010, last year in Munich, and it's partly shown in New York right now. And in the end, if there's still enough time and you're not totally falling asleep yet, I have a different section prepared. Um, it's a uh, exhibition I curated last year in the uh, Temporary Kunsthalle in Berlin. Um, I can shorten this, but it, we'll see how it goes. But <coughs> in the beginning, I would like to take you, or I'd like to introduce you to a work I did in 1994 
in the city space when I was still living in Leipzig. This is, it's a work from 1994. I was invited to a biennial, media biennial, um, to do a more site-specific, city-oriented space. Most of the artworks happened in an actually an actual exhibition exhibition space, all new media oriented, and five or six artists were invited to do something in the city space. And I turned to the neighborhood I've grown up in. It's um, that's my mother with my old cat Moritz, um, and this is the 70s, and that's me on top, already trying the motorcycle. Um, um, and this is a social housing area I grew up with. You see a playground, you see washing stations, um, kindergarten schools. It had three schools in this whole neighborhood. It was um, one of the best areas to live in at the time because it had so central heating, it had, uh, even had telephone, which most of the apartments didn't have until 1990. Um, we had balconies, so it was a very, we were just lucky to get in there. But um, this is what I've been growing up in. And in 1994, I decided to do um, a, a piece inside or outside inside this neighborhood. Um, just to give you an image, the size of the matter is mirrored by the size of the buildings in front of it. So it's probably, if you would fold down um, this apartment building, it has approximately the size of the meadow. And what I did was just transferring certain questions of painting I was interested at the time. Um, these are blackboards, the school boards, um, where I just drew very simple forms with chalk and then painted them out. And I was just trying to transfer this to a city space. But the reason why I would like to introduce this to you is, is something different. The, uh, the main audience of this exhibition would, of course, they would go to the exhibition space that then also would travel around to see the city space pieces, but they wouldn't see much here. They would walk over a lawn, uh, maybe cross a chalk line, but couldn't see anything. Um, I was totally aware of that, and I made my choice that this, is, this would be a piece uh, only for the, uh, the people living in the buildings, because you needed a certain height to look at the meadows to actually get the picture. And then the, uh, these forms would either shrink or would move on the meadows from meadow to meadow. There were nine of these, of these sizes beside each other. So what I was already then aware of was that there is, of course, a general audience when it comes to galleries, when it comes to museums, when it comes to uh, um, to Kunsthalle or Kunstvereins, but there, there's a general, there's a specific audience as well when you come when you work in a city space, and there are also specific ways to deal with a general audience. And this is something I would like to maybe focus on as the wrong wrong term, but uh, this will be my red line today through the talk. As I promised, I would like to start with an exhibition at the secession. And I, of course, um, English is not my native language. If I'm not uh, saying something right, or if you have any questions, you can just interrupt me at any time. The, uh, the secession, maybe I have to give a little bit of a background, is one of the oldest exhibition spaces in Europe. Uh, it was founded in the late 19th century by a group of artists, uh, architects, and um, applied artists. So also one of their main concerns was to bring all these kind of different arts together. And they built this amazing building, uh, or one of, the one of the members of the group designed this amazing building. And it's, uh, it's a Jugendstil building. So typical late 19, early 20th century building. And it was, it was a big bang back then. Also that it was, till today, it's run by a committee made of uh, an artist committee. So there's no director, there's no chief curator. It's still run by artists, but it also means that there also there are architects in it and there are also landscape architects. So it's kind of a diverse group, but mainly dominated by visual artists. Mm, the, so this session has this long, history also of, uh, of bringing different kinds of arts together, which 
doesn't really happen nowadays any longer. So it's mainly visual arts exhibiting there. And you have one major space upstairs, which has the floor plan of a cathedral. And then you have three different spaces downstairs. So you would enter here. You again have a space similar to the main exhibition space in the form of a cathedral floor plan. And you have a kind of an art space which most of the artists don't use because it's more like a transition space with an uh, escape route here, different heights of the ceiling, different floors. So it's kind of an odd thing. And then you would enter the third space, which is again more like a, a large white cube space. And I've, in my career, I've very often focused on art spaces, on in-between spaces, um, entrance halls. So I felt very... Uh, yeah, I felt this should be the center of my work and of the whole installation. So of course, how do you start an exhibition like this? You get this invitation from one of those great institutions. I get very nervous and I'd seen amazing shows there. Most, they do mostly uh, solo shows uh, of not only younger artists, they, it's a kind of a mixture between already established and younger artists. Um, and I've seen great shows there, so I got very nervous and I was asking myself what should I do there and I was also asking them what they expect from me and what they actually can offer and they said, well, uh, we can offer you help but we, we don't have the biggest budget but we can actually raise a lot of money since it's such a popular space which a lot of people also would like to donate money to but um, in general the budget was very limited but then they said, well, our team of technicians is the best in the world. And I've seen this a lot, I've heard this many times, but um, being aware of the exhibitions I had seen, they were always very delicate and stalled. Very also de delicate, necessi not necessarily only in the crafts, but also what was necessary for rep representing the artistic ideas. So I was, um, I kind of felt, well, I want to test this, as this, if this is really, if they are really that good. So I met up with the technicians and immediately get the feeling, got the feeling they have a certain proud in their, in their craftsmanship. And I thought, well, this is a good start for me to, deal, to work with them and also to deal with the, the fact that secession was once founded on the basis of uh, the connection between applied arts and fine arts. So what I did was um, I built a, uh, an architecture in there, which combines three different kind of uh, spaces of representation. It's a very simplified form of a stage than uh, a cabinet, which is a very highly ide ideological um, showcase, and then the catwalk leading into the, the last space. I want to, this, is, this was basically the answer to the question to myself, what I wanted to do, what I needed at, my, at this point of my career. Um, I didn't want to represent, do like a retrospective or something. I wanted to focus on the question of spaces of representation I had dealt with uh, over the last 10, 15 years, but never really put a focus on. So I felt this is something which could bring me also any, f uh, bring me further in my own work uh, to concentrate on that. I'm I just going to take you quickly through uh, the actual architecture. The, uh, the difficult point here was, as you can see, especially with all this inbuilt part, we could not get to the outside parts. So they kind of developed, uh, they, they re-established very old techniques uh, from, from carpenters to actually build this without screws. And the, uh, still the, the whole architect architecture not only had to hold, but also it had to be very, very perfect in, in, the, in the inner part, not in the outer part. So we built this, uh, this stage-like situation first where you had to get on to actually access the other two rooms. So it was already a stepping on a stage in the beginning. You could see that the space would follow, um, but to follow the space up, you had to, to step on and 
become somehow a part of the, or yeah, bringing this whole structure alive. Then on the right side, they would open up a smaller space, what I called cabinet, uh, as a reference to the uh, um, Renaissance uh, studiolos of, Gobin, uh, of um, Gubbio and Albino. And then it would lead to this kind of long catwalk, which almost touches the wall but doesn't. And in the end, you have a situation, a space where you think something could have happened, but you don't know what. There are these chairs, I'm going to come back to them later, and there's this wallpaper, and in the end you don't really know, are you the, the actor or are the chairs the actor? Who's looking at whom? Yeah, so I decided about these three different forms of uh, presentation to connect to one architecture and to build also a space within the space where people had to engage, not necessarily to engage in the way that you have to jump on a bike to tunnel a bike to produce energy to make a projection. It's more about the uh, a subtle question of being becoming aware of certain possibilities which are connected to this sp specific form. So you don't have to jump on a stage to perform something. You don't have to walk on a catwalk like a model. It's not like this, but it, it's more about the uh, kind of uh, bringing up of an awareness what these different spaces usually kind of develop certain functions, certain status, and so on. About these drawings, which are, these are the only so-called art pieces in the whole structure. Um, these are chalk drawings, wet chalk drawings, which almost look like silk screen in the end. Um, they're very bright, so it's not transported right here. Um, and it's, it has been a question since the beginning what these drawings are like. And in the beginning, I actually had problems to really answer this question. Uh, for me, they are very, they are basically metaphors for very simple political issues. You have the passage, you have um, almost like a, the one on the left is almost like a fence structure. You have the in-between space. So it's, these are all metaphors I've used in different installations before, referring to uh, border, referring to the passage as a political term. So there are all these kind of different connotations, but in the end, they're very simple um, concrete or abstract drawings. But also something which I've been only become aware of uh, during one lecture uh, a while ago, that it's also representing literally the architecture which I built in. If you look at uh, this kind of crossing way, which is a kind of an inner part, and then think of the how you have to move within the space, it's also a literal translation of what kind of movement could happen within the space. Some were hanging, some were just randomly put on the floor. And the, um, maybe there are two aspects which I can't really make you, sh uh, can't really show you here is first of all, when you, the ceiling in this part of the succession wasn't high to begin with. Um, but since it was a round ceiling, we had to even drop the ceiling um, and you would step on the structure. So the space lowered a lot. So the, the physical experience of the space was quite drastic. So it was all of a sudden, you were in a much lower, more narrow space. The light changed a lot from very heavy, bright white light, blue light, to this yellowish, um, yellowish light. And even the lights were under the ceiling. So. So even them, they, you wouldn't hit them with your head, but everything shrunk here and made you aware more of you in the space and also um, the dimensions of yourself. One aspect I can't show is also the smell. We built this uh, inside there and also waxed it two days before, three days and then two days before the opening. So this whole space was also filled with this wooden smell 
which was part of the whole experience of this exhibition. It wasn't strong enough that you would paint from it, but it still had an effect. So what has all this to do with the, the questions of representation and presentation? This is one of the, uh, the major references for me when it comes to the marquetry and intarsia pieces I've done, but also when it came to this particularly architectural intervention here. It's the, uh, one of the studio studiolos of Federico de Montefeltro, a typical, very powerful Italian duke in the 15th century. And he built two of these studiolos. One is still in Italy. It's in very, very bad condition, unfortunately. Only partly, it's only, it doesn't exist as a whole any longer. And then there's the, uh, the studiolo, which is placed in the uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. It's not a very large space, so it's maybe a, s a space of this size. And you enter, and you, you it's, it has all these intarsia pieces around, and then portraits on top. So it's a it's nice, cozy space, and you're quite impressed because the um, it's only two dimensional. Everything is um, is flat. The bench doesn't exist. You see, you look into shelves. Even the the writing on the books has this. Um, this three-dimensional effect, even though it's just two-dimensional. It's, it's very detailed, and I think it's the, the high point of yeah, the art of marquetry in Intarsia. But what it actually is, this was the main office of the Duke at the time. This was the space where he developed his, the future, or the idea of the future of his kingdom and of his people. And it was at the same time the space which should represent him the most as, uh, as an open-minded but also very powerful duke of the Renaissance. So connected to, uh, to the arts, to the military and all this, so you find his writing in there, you find books of other artists, uh, uh, authors, you find his instrument, music instruments, you find his weapons, um, big maps. But it's all two-dimensional, so it's all uh, just by inlaying different kinds of wood or just sometimes just changing the, the angle of the structure, this is what this image creates. Another reference for me is Friedrich Kiesler, uh, an Austrian architect, artist, designer, who came to the States already in the 20s. He, uh, the first time he actually came to the States was for uh, an exhibition he designed on new stage designs, uh, set designs. And it's one of the first ideas for the, Peggy G for the Guggenheim Museum in New York because you had in the center you had all the stages and the audience would walk around it to, and look to the inner part of the stage of the set designs. This is just a different piece. It's, uh, City in Space from 25. It's just a structure to uh, a representation structure. So all these paintings, drawings, graphics, photographs laying on top here are not his. So he's a design, uh, an architecture, an exhibition designer. He also worked a lot with the surrealists. Some of the more known ex uh, surrealist exhibitions are designed by him and Duchamp. Um, he uh, also, he's mostly known for his uh, Art of the Century exhibition and gallery design of Ge Peggy, Guggenheim, Gu Peggy Guggenheim's first exhibition space in New York in 44 or 45. And this is just a different uh, way of thinking. And he, has, he was very influential on my thinking because he was one of the first exhibition designers in conjunction especially with the, uh, with the surrealists who developed this idea of an active audience, of an active visitor. So in the, for instance, in the Art of the Century exhibition, you would have these round walls and then baseball bats coming out. And at the end of the baseball bats, you had the, uh, the surrealist paintings, and which you then could move so that in, in the perfect angle for you. So there were a lot of these kind of tools in the exhibition which would activate you as a visitor. 
Yeah, let's just go. The third space would lead you into, or would also one can say, one could argue, would force you to uh, a third space where part of the, uh, the space, not all of it, but part of it was wallpapered with a gray 50 style a, a wallpaper I've, I've used between 2004 and 2009 for a number of exhibitions related to this topic um, or to uh, <coughs> topics related to the 40s and 50s when it comes to representation. In the end of the space, so this, this catwalk would lead almost to the wall, but there would be a gap, but there would be not enough space to actually walk around it, but it would not touch the wall. And then there would be these chairs, and there's, there's a little story about these chairs, and it's actually my joke as an artist, um, which hardly anybody got in, in Vienna. <laughs> but Austrians are not that funny anyway. <laughs> We Germans not either, but uh, this is a small kind of reference. Um, these are Tonet chairs, and Tonet, Michael Tonet was a, a carpenter in the, in the 19th century who already had this company in the 30s and 40s in West Germany, was quite successful, but then went to a recession, had to close the company, and the, uh, but already there was a strong awareness of his quality of craftsmanship in Europe, so the uh, uh, the King of Austria called him to come to Austria and said, you can, you can be a good carpenter in Germany, but you can be a better carpenter and a rich one in Austria. So he packed his stuff, took his family, moved to Austria where he could work. Uh, and first he worked for different companies, but then he opened up his own company again. And here is basically, he, he invented the one of the first modern chairs of, of mass production. So it's basically this, this chair, um, and it has, it's still produced till today, and I think 50 million copies are built till today of this chair. It was dismantable, so you could actually send it um, in a small package and then build it together yourself. It's, it's a typical coffee, Austrian coffee shop chair. Um, And the, the, what I liked about this thing was that, um, beside that, the chair is still, I think, one of a very, very good chair today, um, that I'm, as a German artist, got a call from Vienna uh, to do an exhibition there. And the Tonat, uh, uh, the Michael Tonat was also, he was a German call to Vienna. So I was kind of making this reference also, this amazing craftsmanship. Uh, to the chairs. It was this kind of relationship why I've chosen this particular chairs. Um, we got them from the original company, so they're not the old from the 19th century, they're produced today, but we got them from the original companies. And in the beginning, I thought uh, the plan was actually to stack them just in the corner of the space, so um, as a reference that something could have happened there, but it's long time over. But then I kind of during the installation felt the urge to put a little twist on it and um, actually place them very playful, um, almost as if they become actors in this whole stage-like situation. And then in the end, you had to walk all the way back through the structure to get out. And this is something I've used many times in exhibitions um, also, uh, when I go to exhibitions as a visitor, I, I like the f just the fact to revisit um, the paintings, the sculptures, the installations I'd seen before. Um, sometimes it just changes your perception a lot. And this was the only time when you actually got the title, Stage Diver. Um, it's a wall painting, it's not one of these industrial foil stencils, I don't know what, you, what's Final. the word for Final, yeah. So it's a wall painting. Um, this was also when I saw them working so hard and I was t all the time there, I kind of felt I have to make a painting out of it, not use the stencil also as an uh, appreciation of their work, basically. And in the end, we made a group photo and now they have this, I send it to them, so they have this nice photograph of all of us 
uh, in their workshop now. It was also, it's that the title appeared in the end was something, um, was a very conscious idea. It has to do with a certain effect where I'm um, a little bit aware of the fact that very often today um, people come to exhibitions then first of all before they have seen anything of the show they grab the sheet read an A4 page of introduction to the show and then look at the artworks and I'm kind of critical of that because very often these texts are very complicated to read and they already build up a filter to look at the works and I'm not arguing against these texts that's, uh, that's not what I'm doing but I just think um, first you have to look at the work and then if you need any kind of assistance then you can uh, hold on to guards or or these kind of texts so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to introduce the title in the end on your way out already <coughs> the second exhibition I would like to talk to you was very different it's only there are only two years in between but um, every other like three four five years my work shifts uh, drastically and there are certain strings or certain lines of ideas which go through but very often then a, some, a totally new topic or new media new uh, material comes in this is also different because it's not an institution it's a private gallery in Munich and which brings up different connotations of budget, of interest, the gallerist has different interests as you. So, and especially with the secession, which was such an amazing, uh, yeah, such amazing corp uh, corporation. Um, I thought it would be interesting to have a gallery show afterwards where the gallerist has a totally different uh, interest. But before I start with that, I would like also to uh, to show you a catalog I produced for this show. I leave them here so you can look at them after after the talk. Um, something which is important for the secession as well. First of all, for them, it's very important to inter to realize the artistic idea 100%. Something which not a lot of museums do today or can do. So the secession at one point when we realized this is going to be way over budget. Uh, I, I already was thinking about plan B and plan C, C and um, but my the curatorial assistant who was responsible for me there, she uh, she said no no that's where my job starts and she was trying to get the budget and then she found somebody who actually sponsored the material which was most of the costs for this uh, for this show and this was also a point where I invited Stephanie Smith uh, to write a text and uh, it was quite an interesting answer to my invitation or re reaction to my in invitation because there's a there's a problematic fact with most of these catalogs which usually appear during the exhibition or in the best case even before the opening and Stephanie was kind of, kind of reacting on that that she had to write a text about something, about an installation, but also about people reacting to this installation, which doesn't even exist yet. So it's an uh, this it's a must read almost I would say. I was very happy with it. So this was my second exhibition with this uh, gallery. It's a rather young gallery, but I have a long relationship with the uh, the gallerist because she was the former director of the Friedrich Kiesler archive in Vienna um, and then for personal reason had to move back to Munich and open up this gallery uh, with a totally new program. The show was called Tracking My Your Desire and My was blocked out as um, uh, already questioning the opposition again who is who and who is reacting on whom and a lot of my work has, or not a lot, but again and again, a certain activity has appeared in titles. Uh, here's a tracking of titles like Looking at the Mountains of Desire, uh, Walking Through the Fields of History. So there's always a, a certain activity in the title which is 
which was also partially to the installation uh, we just saw. It's a very, uh, very simple space. So you come in from the street, it's almost like a, a storefront, and then you have one space and it opens up uh, to the back for another small show a showcase and then the offices. So it's very clear and simple. You have two windows and a door in between. For, for this particular show, I kind of wanted to develop a visual vocabulary for a political metaphor I've, I've been concentrating uh, over the years a little bit, not necessarily in my artistic work. It's the bundle, um, which, which is, it has different connections. You can, if you, um, if you look at a piece like on the right side, you immediately think of camping. Um, but it's, for me, it's also related to idea of homeless people, of hobos. Um, basically, the bundle as an expression of, um, or a possibility for me to focus on questions of uh, volition and um, compulsion. Is it compulsion or volition? It's, um, yeah. And it was about these questions where you are sometimes you're free to leave your home to go somewhere else, but very often you are also forced to leave. And it's about this relationship between compulsion and volition, um, which I wanted to uh, to express here in this exhibition. So there are there are these very simple black ropes. They are bondage ropes uh, going through the whole space, but also defining space just by tiny lines defining space where you then would be forced to move or you can also just duck under the lines. Then you would have these different felt sculptures. You would have uh, hanging felt sculptures. You would have uh, this more architectural piece. Um, then the two more round pieces and this three-legged piece here, which is um, one of my favorite pieces because it also expresses what's happening in the space in a sculptural form. So what's happening with the, with the black lines in the space is there with the black and white uh, sticks formulated as a sculpture. One of the uh, centerpieces here was actually a sculpture incorporating four books. It was almost like a shelf, which you can see from here partly it had three different levels and the books were slid from the side. The books were covered in the same felt and the content was about 200 pages each book where I drew on, where I painted on, um, cut out. They were focusing on questions. One book was focusing on censorship. Uh, one book was uh, focusing on absence. So they all different had different connotations and you could actually take them out and I made this little table in the window where you could then uh, lay out and go through. This is the book con uh, focusing on censorship where uh, pages were cut to, uh, tucked together, were cut out, parts of the paper was cut out. Um, there was a, what's it, when you wipe out text, um, Erase. what? Erase. Erase text or uh, with stencil. So there were all these kind of Mm, activities to get rid of information, to get rid of uh, certain marks. But the interesting part is that very often when you delete something somewhere, uh, it appears on another page again. So the, where I tucked pages together, uh, the tuckers formulated on another page again in the shape of uh, on, on the other page. So it was... Um, I almost did a scenario in this book which would lead you from page to page to page through the whole thing. Um, there was another book which, where I cut out the whole, uh, a, th a third of the, the pages. So it was much lighter than the others and all the edges were drawn with uh, stencils. And the red book was a book where I threw 200 pages um, I threw, it was the book I, I needed the most time with. Fine, thin lines went from page to page. Sometimes they were crossing, sometimes not. 
and when they were crossed, they were marked like, uh, like the hanging pieces where the lines hit each other, then there's a, a sculptural formulation. And the green book was literally empty, and I only used graffiti to turn the pages. So only in the corner you had marks of the usage of this book, kind of marks of that something has happened again. So this was in the center of the exhibition, and everything which was formulated in the books was formulated in the exhibition as well in a sculptural or spatial way. And sometimes these ropes would just by going not parallel, exact parallel to the sidewall, would create a little corner where then, uh, a little space where then these, these sculptures were laying on. And again, something which I've used in different uh, exhibitions, this black and white dualism, um, with each sculpture appears again as a, which I've used first when I introduced gender studies in my work in the 90s and then uh, I kind of repetitive, repetitively uh, used it again during the Cold War topic. So this is something, the, um, this dual lesson where I find a very simple expression in this black and white structure. So people would come in and uh, would find their way through the ropes and move uh, from sculpture to sculpture. It was very, it was very limited, very subtle. So it was not necessarily, um, when I was talking about activating audience, it's not necessarily about taking out a book and reading a book. It's more about movements and um, creating certain spaces. People either follow the lines or they don't. But it's it's always an option not to. Uh, to follow these kind of barriers. These were the two exhibitions I wanted to show you about my own work. Um, both of them showed that there's a certain interest of uh, audience, how to deal with audience, how to give audience a different access um, through the topics I'm working on, sometimes with the book, shell, the the book sculpture, it kind of it helped to find relations between what's happening in the book and what's happening in the space. Um, at the secession, it was more kind of a force, more like a very autocratic um, or authoritarian gesture uh, that I blocked your way with this uh, architecture and you, you had to get on to actually see anything. So it's kind of, um, it's different gestures. Something which I've also introduced in my curatorial work um, lately more and more, um, this consideration of audience. I've, I've been curating exhibitions since I'm 23 um, because one of the reasons when I started curating was that I, um, it was actually a point of my career where I, how shall I put this? Um, maybe I started a different end. I'm working class. I didn't study art. Um, I never went to any kind of university. I'm trained as a mechanic in a coal mining area in a power station. Um, and I'm also coming from very low class, uh, working class background. So I have no, my idea of culture was based on radio music and sports and I was a, I also was a semi-professional wrestler. So this was my, my cultural background basically. Um, so I, from the beginning I had an interest in mediation because I was very much aware of the fact how disturbing contemporary art or art in general can be and that it sometimes needs a little push um, or it just needs somebody to break down barriers. So it's, um, I've been aware of the difficulties of presentation of contemporary art, but some, some experience or some exhibition taught me a very important lesson. Um, it was my first real art exhibition I went to. It was Max Ernst, The Surrealist. Um, back then I didn't know what the surrealists were and a friend tried to explain it to me. It didn't succeed it. I had no clue. I went to this Max Ernst show. I loved it. I was very impressed. I didn't understand a thing. I didn't 
didn't know what this all was about and what it was actually, but I liked it and I got curious. And um, so it, for me, curating or also switching over to curating was a very logical way just to, that I would produce my own stuff, but also would mediate uh, other colleagues' work um, or would recognize a certain connection between works. It was a very simple uh, motivation in the beginning to curate. Um, also, I realized that there have been certain artists have been much better in expressing ideas I would be interested in than I will ever do. So I, I rather represented their artworks than making new ones where which were not better than theirs. So, um, but it has changed over the years, and I've always kept on with the curating and last year or the two years ago I was invited to uh, curate a show at the temporary Kunsthalle which was uh, it was just one of these places at the time in Berlin where everybody was talking about and it was huge it was massive uh, here you can see the space um, and it was right in the city center of Berlin right at the Schlossplatz or the former castle which doesn't exist any longer um, it has all this, it's in a place where all the governments try to occupy and put their, yeah, put their label on basically. So you have this wild mixture of historical architecture, modern architecture from the GDR time, from the socialist time. And that's where they put for two years this temporary Kunsthalle invited me. So I got like, oh, what shall I do there? And also didn't want to do it alone. So I invited my friend Jörg Vandenberg, um, who, that's his name, Jörg Vandenberg, who's an art historian and, and curator I've, I'm in a constant discussion with. So when I got this invitation, I thought, well, I better um, jump on a discussion I already lead um, instead of inventing something totally new. And I curated shows with him over the years uh, in a small amount of number, but it was always quite refreshing for me um, and we have similar ideas. So I invited him to do this with me together. Also more to enter a discussion instead of just putting myself out there as a curator. We did a show of 17 international artists, most of them based in Berlin. This was kind of the concept of the Kunsthalle to present in the international scene of Berlin which is kind of a strange thing. You have a lot of international artists living and working in Berlin, but beside the commercial galleries, they are not shown in Berlin. So um, that is kind of the gap the Kunsthalle wanted to, uh, to fill. And in the first year, there were only solo shows, and in the second year, they uh, decided to invite artists to curate shows. We, since this was such a strongly occupied, ideologically, occupied space in the city, we thought about doing something about memory, about remembering and forgetting as something which is very important for every society, but for every person as well. And it's, it's also the basic foundation for reception and art piece. If you look at a Renaissance painting, you can't see it everything all the time. It's also, so you have to all the time kind of remember and forget things and connect them to, to an image, but also the image itself is very much about what it shows and what it's not showing. So it's, it's the basic foundation for every, or for most of the art pieces, but it's also very important for the society and particularly this, this spot. What we did was uh, a quite dance exhibition. Um, there were a lot of artworks in it 22 artworks, sometimes um, very large installations, very large sculptures. So this piece on the right top side is a Manfred Pernice exhibition, uh, Manfred Pernice sculpture where you can go inside, but you also can go up. And this was the only part where you can overlook, could overlook the whole exhibition. But um, we just didn't just wanted to bring works together. We wanted to have a discussion between the works, but we also wanted to um, find a way to engage with the place where the Kunsthalle was placed on. So what we did here was also we introduced this kind of fence structure, um, which 
softly uh, connected some of the larger installations. So we had a fence where we also bought, built kind of a, a sitting area in the middle. So it this was in the middle of the exhibition. But by doing so, we divided the, um, the space into three zones. Um, we also were aware of exhibitions where this is the way you would enter. Like you look now in the space, this is the entrance, and you would immediately see the exit. We wanted to stop this. We wanted to block this out. So um, I would just, I just didn't like shows where I would enter and then, okay, there's the cafe. So I can like rush over and just run by the artworks. So we wanted to block these wakes. And then there was one afternoon where we went to uh, a famous park outside of Berlin, um, which is a mixture of an English garden and a French park. English garden with this meandering ways where you would see a pavilion over there, but you would have to go over there to get there. And then it has also these French park uh, lines cutting through over miles uh, through the park so you could see from one end to the other. And this is a mixture. And this is something where we're having a walk there discussing this exhibition in the early stages. And then we thought maybe this is like an idea we can put, we can lay underneath the exhibition um, in a way that you would be able to see from here, you would be in the first part, you would be able to see works in the other part, but you could not go there. There would be a fence or a kind of a barrier. So we, what we did was we designed three different sections. So you would come in here, you would be able to walk around, see, you would even be able to see other works, but then you would have to go out again, come to the site entrance, enter again, see another part, go out again, come, go in through the last, uh, to the, the actually exit, uh, see all the works behind. You could climb up from there to the Manfred Penis piece, um, but you, you always had to move around. So you were around with artworks which were concentrating on questions of remembering and forgetting. Um, at the same time, you are pulled out again to the the city life, you would face the big cathedral of Berlin, you would face the TV tower from the socialist time, uh, you would face the museum island. So it was always this kind of going in and out again. And when we developed this idea, I was, I was totally convinced this is not going to work. If I would be forced to do so, I would hate it. I would just either leave the show or I would just climb over the fence. <laughs> and but not, especially in a city like Berlin, with the wall, you would think people would knock down this fence. Um, they didn't. Uh, most of them actually move. I, I had very good relations with the guards, which were students. Um, so they, uh, they said most of the people just followed it and did it and moved out, in it, which, I, which is nice. Um, but we specifically instructed the, the guards that they should not prevent people from climbing through the gate, through the fence, or even easily step over the bench. Uh, what only a few people did. They shouldn't engage them, but they should not um, try to defend them. So, uh, or try to hold them back. So it was quite a surprise that it worked in that way. Um, this, but it doesn't say much about how we uh, interlaid, how we interreacted the pieces with each other. Um, this is a long process, and that's, that's why I was also very happy to uh, work together with Jörg Vandenberg, because we have this experience of, um, of installation. We have this experience of talking, finding a, a similar language with each other um, with the works. What we basically did is we built a little a net of references between all the works beside each other. Sometimes they are very simple and um, formal, very simple formal connections. Like here you have a piece by Simon Wachsmuth referencing um, uh, a uh, Biedermeier uh, home set with the table and the chairs and the, the city wardrobe. Um, 
but you have no walls. Then you have a house in the back painted by Kati Barat, like a, a shed structure where you don't really know if it's built or if it's falling apart. And then you have a house with an inner and an outer part of um, uh, Manfred Pernice. So sometimes it had these very literal, very simple uh, formal connections. But sometimes it was even much more more subtle, much more, yeah, depended more if you would be able to see things. I just want to give you these like two or three examples uh, what how this show worked. Um, you see the sculpture in the, uh, here in the back, it's, it's actually the, the first sculpture you saw in the beginning. It's a piece by, here on the left side, it's a piece by Franka Hörnschemeyer, who in the late 80s built these two walls and an exhibition space in Basel out of uh, uh, drywall. drywall. And, but she used a different system. Usually you have this metal structure and you just screw the drywalls onto it, but she did it differently. She just glued all these drywalls together so this huge wall would be freestanding. So, and after the show, she cut it in blocks. So this was the thickness of the wall. And so she cut this off, uh, cut this apart, and since then has been using the material, recycling the material, to build these temporary architectures. So you would come in the show, and would be bam, totally blocked by it. So, um, but also immediately had a touch to the material, and by getting very close, you could actually actually see the glue uh, coming out between these. Um, the, um, between the plaster wall blocks. So, um, but you could walk around and then you realize you can actually go inside and this was the, the, the a, a possibility to actually give you a relation to your body because the, the space was so large and so 10 meters high, you would totally feel lost. But here, it gave you a proportion to your body again. So it's an architecture, an inner architecture, which pushes you back to your own physical experience, uh, ap appearance, um, existence. And then on the other side of the exhibition, really on my straight, straight through the exhibition, you had these mummies. Um, these are paintings by Antje Majewski, um, accompanied by an On Kavara piece from 19, a date painting from 1967. Um, these are based on original photographs from the 19th century when the English digged out all the mummies in the Valley of the Kings. Um, and then they were cutting them open and you could literally see how they fell or fall apart. And one of them took photographs. So, but already in the process, you could also already see the, how they fell apart. And these are painters on, paintings on alum, aluminum boards. And uh, you would look at them, if you come out of this architecture of Franke Hörnschemeyer, this is what you looked at. You came out and this is like straight in the other edge. And I find it, this is how we, how we worked it, how we installed it, that you come out of an architecture which uh, creates an awareness of your own physical existence again. Um, and then you look at a dismantling or a, a body which has a whole in its belly, creating again an inner architecture. These are the, uh, the strings we tried to pull, and some of them were consciously, some of them just happened. So it was also, I gave about 30 tours in this exhibition over the th uh, three months of the exhibition, um, and each time I discovered something new. Um, but of course, like this, this was consciously done, uh, and this could also, only be happened because um, of a very strong awareness of the work. So we did a lot of extensive research uh, in, the, uh, in the studios. We did a lot of studio visits. Um, it's, this is where we start from. We are not starting from an idea. We, we started from an awareness that a lot of artists work with the questions of remembering and forgetting. There's a, there's a again and again, not necessarily today, but again and again, is, it's one of the major topics of artists, and that was the reason why I wanted to concentrate on. 
So, but this, this whole layout was um, full of these connections and still it was a very open exhibition. It was still, um, yeah, how to say, it was a place to wander around. Um, it was a place to walk through, to find your own ways, um, to look at things. And it was less dominated by us than one would expect from now what I'm telling you. So people found it quite, uh, they enjoyed it. So that's at least the, the response I got from, uh, from the guards. So it was also, there was no entrance fee. So the uh, people would came back, would come back a couple times. It was also, it was in the city, of, city center. So it was, everybody was passing it again and again. And l l last but not least, the artists were happy. So it was, um, we were quite nervous in a city like Berlin where a lot of things happening, but there are not very deep discussions in the city. So it's a lot of, a lot of activity, but not a lot of content. Um, so we were nervous if, um, if this would at all work in Berlin, but we were quite surprised that there is obviously also a need for discussion. So when we did the artist talks every Monday and the curatorial um, tours, um, there were always at least 80 people attending the artist talks. So it was, there, is, there was this interest um, in the topic, but also in the works of the artists. And this is, of course, our main goal, to uh, represent the ideas of the other artists. And um, this was also just possible because of the engagement of all of them, of all 17. And it was a great possibility. And it was a great step for me in my curatorial practice. And something what I, I get goosebumps when I say this, but um, by working so close with your colleagues, um, you get such a strong insight view on how they work, how they also behave. I learned a lot on the human side, not only for my, uh, uh, for my artistic practice, but it's so rewarding so that I always can just um, recommend to do a thing like this, to work with your colleagues. And this is, and this is of course, the, re the source where this all started. Um, this working together, this is my kindergarten group uh, <laughs> from uh, right before I went to school then. Yeah, and that's now only up to you to find me there. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. And Is there, if there are any questions. Um, that I think one, um, I just had this sort of comment and question about this sort of train that I see like through your own work of like not only this question of kind of like dualisms, but also particularly the one that it seems you keep returning to is this issue of the sort of the formal and then also like this ex like expressionistic quality. And I also want to say about the show, I saw that show and I thought like it was one of the best sort of uses of particularly, because it's such a massive sort of open space and thinking of the way that you sort of can demarcate a particular experience within that without having things where it's kind of like blocked off or like putting in sort of wall walls or different other things that sort of and kind of break off the flow. But I guess Thank you. what I, yeah, it was really great. But what I was wondering, like, where do you find for yourself this kind of, um, of like negotiating that, that quality of kind of the formal, but I mean very much in this, there are a lot of like formal decisions within that show and within your own work of kind of, um, I think that sensibility, but at the same time that it's very intuitive as well. So I wonder like how you kind of, how you work with that and thinking also that it has that very, there's a very precise quality within like the first work that you showed where there's the other sort of um, option that you could have something like, you know, like a mitzvah where it becomes like it's very expressionistic, but it's, it's formal at the same time. So I was just wondering about that. This was a long question. <laughs> 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 um, 
maybe two answers. One yeah. is one starts very early. Um, when I was a semi-professional wrestler, um, I was also not not the American wrestling. <laughs> it's like the Olympic game wrestling. Greek wrestling. What? Greek wrestling. Greek wrestling. Yeah. Um, I was also coaching at the time. Um, and if you think of a group, um, you have to. I would come into the group, and you have to be develop a certain awareness of dealing with single people with their qualities and um, what's the opposite of quality and disadvantage, defects. Um, but at the same time, you have a group, so you have to focus on this balance that you support uh, each single person, um, pull out their strengths um, at the same time be aware that they have to function in a group. And if you translate this to an exhibition, either my own exhibition or a group exhibition, it's the same thing. It's about the balance between finding the perfect presentation for each single work, as well as um, making sense in a group. So this is something which I, I don't know, I, I became, became aware of very early on while coaching, and it helped me helps me till today to um, yeah to find this to or to define a relationship between between the two of them. But concerning the other answer, the formal and the more expressionist, the uh, the conceptual and the intuitive, it's something which came from gender studies actually. Um, in my early works, I was very formal, I think, and I was not intuitive. I developed an idea and then was following through the idea. But through gender studies, especially through masculinity studies, I became more and more aware of certain uh, male habits, male structures um, of myself also, and which led me to a different openness. And intuition came one of the biggest challenges for me. And that's, I think, where the quality of my work um, jumped drastically. So it was kind of a psychological step for myself. And I've been focusing on that a lot. And it, it is, it was quite challenging for myself, but it was also very rewarding to find now in a balance, this kind of back and forth between concept, idea, and intuition, um, between content and form. and. There's, there's a, a show which I didn't talk about today. There's, there's a catalog form show in which focuses very much on the relation between uh, realism and formalism um, as one of the major problems of Cold War period. Um, it took me three years uh, to work on this show, and it was exactly also a period where I became more and more intuitive, where I could really balance out this relationship. I could go into the museum, the space, with some ideas, change them, go back, and in the end worked back and forth between content and form and between concept and intuition. So it's, um, it was a long way, it, 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 but also changed totally my way of working as an artist. Is it normal at that space um, to do so many guided tours, or was that your own uh, choice to do? You said 30 yeah. tours, and you were all you were present for all of those? You yeah. Know? yeah. Is that yeah. unusual? It sounds yeah, it is unusual. <laughs> but um, there was also a team. I mean, yeah. all the guards were also trained to give tours, oh, and right. they did. But there was such a... Um, um, these only these 30 tours were addressed personally yeah. to me. Um, so uh, beside the six, every Monday we would do an artist talk, and before that we would do a cur the curators, we would give a tour. Yeah. Um, but obviously there was also this interest in the tours. Um, and I, I think, you know, I don't curate five shows a year. I curate sometimes two shows a year, or sometimes one show every second year. Um, so I get very engaged with it as well. And I was, I was so fond of it as well. And uh, I like the works in there. Um, so uh, uh, I like to be there as well. So it was um, just, 
you create this very often we, as an artist you go someplace you do an exhibition and then you stay for a week or a couple of days but you very often you can't go back and here it was in the city I was living in and I liked what I saw I liked what the results of these artists um, so it was also a pleasure to give this to it was very tiring as well yeah. um, it almost broke my neck especially yeah. doing this uh, also the catalog at the same time mm. Mm. But it was also challenging in a way that in the beginning, you know, uh, this exhibition was built by the fact that I wanted a very direct entrance to the works. Um, you would come in, you would hit this wall right away, which jumped you back to a, a series of photographs from the 80s from Michel Schmidt. So also the catalog is, is um, this is the cover um, with only half a cover, so you're right in the exhibition. And this was what I, what we are aiming for. Uh, no distance to the work, mm -hmm. right there. Um, feeling the material, seeing the ideas and so on. Stepping on, going on top of the Panisse sculpture. And, and then we were giving the first tours and I realized I'm doing fucking wrong here. I'm, I was giving all the information which I knew uh, from the artists from the studio visits. And I said, no, this is not what we wanted to do. We, partic we specifically decided against descriptions of the works beside the works. Um, something which the, the uh, director and the team of the um, Kunsthalle demanded from the very first meeting. Um, and I had to, in the beginning, I said, yeah, we're going to do it. We find a way. And in the end, there was no text on it, only the titles on the floor, um, which sometimes give the titles give clues to the work. And, and now I was doing these tours and I was doing exactly the opposite. I was giving all these informations which were not there instead of talking about the pieces which were there. And then we switched. I said, okay, from this time on, I only talk with a vocabulary which is in the exhibition. It was very, very tough in the beginning, but it was also, it was good. All of a sudden I was only talking about things you could see. I was a blind visitor. Yeah. Instead of having giving away all this additional information, and I, I felt no, there is already so much given, and there is also a clear. We talked about this today uh, a lot. There is a clear decision between what the artist said: this is in the piece, and this is not. Mm -hmm. Like this is not. So, um, so these these tours also taught me something. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to it at the end? Do you dissemble it, put it together in other pieces? <laughs> it, it got dissembled, and it's in my, I have a large um, storage in Leipzig where I'm from. And the idea is actually, it was from the very beginning to build it up in a different space again. To, because it still has the, uh, it's dominated by the structure of the secession. And I, want, I was curious what is happening if if it's put in another interesting architecture. Yeah. It hasn't happened yet. So it's, there was an interest now in New York, but I said, this is, I'm not gonna do it. It's too crazy. Uh, it was too short. If you have enough time, enough money to ship it over, then it would be possible. But it's, it's a massive amount of very heavy. And I might have to, because of also transportation, I might have to adjust it a bit. And but in general, I would like to, I would love to put it up in a different space again and see what kind of reaction then happens between a sculpture of a specific space and another space. Yes. <laughs> yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. Still, well, I can still get stuck in his tries. Yeah. 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 Time for a couple more questions. I think Sal had his hand up. Um, when speaking about architecture exhibitions and alignments um, between the plastic arts and architecture, um, generally, especially with something like the succession, there's a kind of movement from, for instance, a doorknob to a city plan. Yeah.
at least with these exhibitions um, that you've shown, there's a kind of interiority. Mm -hmm. um, but then also there's not much um, a kind of outside. Um, it's not as much of a kind of multi-dimensional thing can you move from, for instance, an interior to a facade to a street to, you know, I mean, you're definitely dealing with these kinds of, I guess, architectural issues, like where you place walls, how you direct attention, um, you know, how do you move people through a space, for instance, but, um, and maybe this is too large of a question, but I'm wondering if you personally have any kind of societal revisioning um, politically, um, you know, what, essentially, what are you using these walls to mobilize um, on a larger scale? Mm. Maybe you don't need to answer that. I no, know, no, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. Um, uh, um, in the beginning, I showed this more city space oriented piece, um, which was a transition of painting um, into the city space. At the same time, it was uh, was of the it was it was happening right in the time of transition in the GDR, where I'm from. Um, it was in 1994. Um, the wall had come down, uh, a lot of investment from West Germany moved in, a lot of improvements, but also a lot of bad improvements, and a lot of um, privatization of public space happened, um, because these were public matters. I kicked football on these, or soccer on these fields, and but already kicked off then by older people. Um, but at the time, there was all the time a certain awareness and fear of changes. So when we were doing these very simple geometrical drawings with chalk drawings uh, on the matters, there were two kinds of people uh, reacting to that. One would come down, discuss with us, first very angry what we were doing there, because they were protecting their neighborhood, being afraid of that we would build something there, that, um, that uh, we would do a party there, just circling something up, or a sports field, that's where you know it from, um, these kind of techniques. Um, but, it's, but then we got in an, into a discussion, what this is about, about it's also about these, uh, about this fear, basically. So it was, uh, I didn't mention this in the beginning, um, but this, this, Activating of this kind of discussion was uh, a very strong concern for me in the political groups I was involved at the time, as well in this particular piece. The other group of people just called authority to send somebody. Um, so the, it was the two uh, reactions, but we got a lot of reactions. This was only we took it took us two days to build it uh, to make it, and then uh, it was only up for two weeks, and then the wind had blown everything away. But the uh, it was again about the public discussion um, and then I was at the same time I would tour around give lectures on on these kind of security city uh, of the the fail of public spaces or the the occupation by our authorities of public spaces at the time so this is maybe one part of an answer um, there's a whole line of work um, which I didn't show today where go back again and again to public space to engage these kind of discussions and sometimes they actually lead to uh, a specific goal, sometimes not, they just uh, open up the discussion. Um, with the secession piece, um, I'm also with another museum show, much larger but also um, dealing with the physical experience of political questions. Um, I'm trying to create partially awkward situations. It's not necessarily nice to walk through this. Um, it's not, I'm, I'm not gaining uh, or trying to find a nice, a creative nice en environment necessarily. They look sometimes very nice, like on the very first image with the Beats Curtain, um, this is uh, a Beats Curtain 64,000 
wooden beads creating a curtain where you go in and then you're covered around and then you have to you step out and you're in the second part of the exhibition. Um, first of all, you feel cozy because of the wooden beads and the, uh, what did you, hostel? Uh, no, the uh, home, you used the word, oh, um, like the feeling of a home, basically, okay. yeah. Uh, but then you read Cold War, so there's a, a slight switch of from feeling in a cozy environment and then to a political meaning. And that's what I'm, on a very subtle way, uh, trying to achieve uh, a relationship between sometimes nice sculptures and a certain nice appearance and then in a kind of awkward situation. And sometimes I get more literal and sometimes not. Mm. What's this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good. We have one last question. Yes. yes. So uh, you show few nostalgic photographs of East Germany. Yeah. How do you feel now as person who born in GDR and so on, the last 20 years from artistic point of view? How did you change when when you involved? Oh, yeah. Change. No, no. Um, I showed only personal photographs yeah, so yeah. to give you an sure, sure. image yeah. of where I'm from. Sure. Also, um, when I was, I, I can't really talk about an artistic change because I was 17 when the wall came down, and I had no connection to mm -hmm. art at the time. Um, I can talk about the personal change, um, which is quite drastic and it's a, it's a mixture of feelings. In a way I'm very happy that I'm lucky uh, to grow up in a different society now, the second part of my life, um, with uh, a different freedom, a different freedom of travel. I wouldn't be here uh, when the wall would still be up. I wouldn't be able to access uh, all these different cu cultures. Uh, I wouldn't be able to read the books I read today. Um, at the same time, of course, um, I'm torn apart also, or I'm kind of shifting towards a more, what you say, nostalgic uh, mm -hmm. feeling of a certain safety, of a certain, because if you didn't get into political problems, the GDR was kind of a safe place. Uh, just from the moment you would raise a different thinking and would even talk about it or act differently, then you got into problems. But I was too young. Uh, I had some problems at school, um, but it's kind of. Uh, I see also a lot of difference in this capitalist country, or this capitalist system today, and sometimes it is both ideologies kind of jump in my, my head around and tore me to one side or the other. Um, but doing more and more research also on the, on, on the history of the East and the West, you see more and more the difficulties for, of both societies, especially also during the Cold War, how they reacted. And uh, I'm lucky enough, in Germany, there's, uh, there's actually public discourse about these periods. If you go, I've, I've done exhibitions a lot in the Eastern European parts, not in the Soviet Union, but in, in a couple of, countries of former Yugoslavia, Hungary, Bulgaria, uh, Bulgaria, Poland, Czech, um, and you realize they don't have this public discourse. There are only a few people who are trying to deal with these historical matters, but not as a public discourse. There's also not this public support, which in Germany is. There's a lot of public money. It's also, I mean, there are always groups of interest behind that, but it is happening. And um, yeah, but I'm, I'm probably giving a kind of a vague answer to your question, but I'm, I'm torn apart a little bit. I have both souls in myself, and, um, but I'm totally aware of a difference between uh, an idea of a socialist society and the reality, of course. I'm not nostalgic in the way that I uh, only at kind of ten, have a tendency towards the idea. But there was one. I had a question. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of about some of the details of your work. Um, 
and like the title of Sage Diver and if that comes up, you know, where that comes from it makes me think of sort of like a leap of faith into a crowd, you know, and if, if that is the kind of seed which where it's, where it's, you know, if, that, if that's where it comes from and, and then and the, the other specific kind of detailed question is about, um, you mentioned, uh, I think you titled the piece Tracking Crossed Out My, Your Desires. Was that the one with the bondage yeah, rope? Yeah. yeah. So I was kind of wondering about your use of color and the and the material of the ropes themselves and like literally calling them bondage ropes. So they, they are bought in a bondage shop. So okay. they are, I think in the end they're ordinary ropes, but I specifically well, uh, bought them in the bondage in a SMN shop. Um, because it's this whole thing, um, the, this whole exhibition, as I said, was about uh, compulsion and volition, um, about this relationship of uh, forcing something or having freedom to decide. So this is, it's, um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's essential to bondage, um, but at the same time, bondage is creation of image. It's not, we all think about wild tech, uh, sexual things, but it's in the end it's just, they create images with that. And um, with the, uh, the bondage ropes, I, I did basically uh, a drawing you could step into. So it was this, these kind of relations. Um, um, but the, uh, just, you know, uh, the, when I talk about um, compulsion and volition, uh, it would it would pick or picture itself uh, the relation between this very neat and strong tight ropes here with the knots I designed specifically for it, and then where this would break open here. Um, this is this is where I'm talking about the relation about this very strongly, neatly organized, tight thing, and then here where the material finds its way and it's kind of welding. It's not not nicely cut. Um, it's partly ripped off, and it's it's find its way basically. So this is uh, also one of the the details. You have to you, you look into, and also sometimes they're wrapped, and sometimes everything is just falling apart. But at the same time, creates an order as well. But what was, what was the first part of your question? The first one was um, the, the question about stage divers. Is it a leap of faith into a crowd? Um, that's an interesting thought. It was originally it came from that you you climb up a stage and then you mm -hmm. jump off. Mm -hmm. So you. Uh, you are not the one usually who acts on the stage, but with the stage diving, you are the one climbing up and then uh, becoming for a short period <laughs> the active. That's that's where it came from. But the uh, the idea of the lead uh, is kind of interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila.